Good morning. Um, my name is Erica Renault. I'm the business manager for Vitalis Organic Seeds. Um, and I'm just going to uh, give this perspective a little bit from a, a seed company. Um, Vitalis is a, an international company. Um, we breed and seed, produce seed. Um, we don't sell direct to farmers or in a very limited way in North America. And uh, it, this company has been in existence for 76 years. It's third generation uh, Dutch company. And we started in the United States in 2007. And, um, um, and right now there's a group of us here that work in Canada, US and Mexico. As is indicated here, we're selling organic seed in 35 countries. We have over 500 um, cultivars, and um, we certify to the European, Japanese, uh, Canadian, U.S., and I imagine soon to be Mexican standards. So why why do we breed uh, organic seed? Because that was uh, just one of the components of what we were going to discuss today. Um, ultimately, Vitalis originally started when a breeder uh, working within a conventional seed company observed the um, cultivar performance differences in certain characteristic traits in some of the crops he was breeding for and initially asked the seed company that he was working for if he could breed explicitly um, for organic systems. This was in the uh, early 90s, and at that time, um, the company implied that they weren't ready for a breeder dedicated 100% to organic seed. And um, luckily, he was sufficiently savvy, and he went out and launched Vitalis on his own. But because he had originally been within um, a global seed company, he, he got so excited about his vision that he went to uh, several seed companies and shared his ideas and the progress he'd made at Vitalis and partnered with the global vegetable breeding company Enza Zaden. And these are some of the things that we, um, um, I think that, you know, these are themes throughout this conference, of course, that can be weaved into almost every presentation this weekend. Um, explicitly, we're trying to ensure or, uh, organic integrity, start the organic production cycle with the first input in certified organic um, form. And uh, some of the very specific things in our breeding strategies when we're looking at our crop models that we're considering are, you know, um, what, is, what, is, what is the G by E or the genotype by environment interaction of this cultivar or this breeding material? Um, is this cultivar, the parent lines, are they um, nitrogen use efficient or utilize um, effectively the management system in an organic soil system? Um, what is their disease resistances and does that um, apply to the bioregion or the target area that we're breeding for? Um, how is the plant architecture and how does it adapt to the production systems that um, with the growers with whom we're working? And, uh, you know, is the, are, is the cultivar performance, are they early emerging? Do they have the capacity to um, emerge and uh, demonstrate an architecture that supports uh, weed management more effectively in an organic system. And also early maturing. In a lot of crops that we're working in, a lot of the organic growers actually want um, some fairly um, fast varieties because of, um, because of weed pressure and the need for certain different kinds of um, uh, organic uh, pest or insect or weed management systems. So this is very broad stroke, but this is sort of just to give you a picture of how we're functioning, um, generally speaking. We have certain crops we work in. We don't work in all crops. We're fairly specialized. And um, we have product development teams. We have sales and marketing teams. Um, we have to do a lot of forecasting and planning for uh, our seed production planning and our market estimations, um, obviously breeding. and fairly sophisticated quality control because we're moving seed on an international level. So how this um, it link, there's a very specific linkage to this process because one of the components that um, is intrinsic to organic seed sourcing is that um, there is a, 
a knowledge of the size of the markets and the requirements of the market and when it's required. And it's, um, this is something that is often overlooked in the inspection process that a grower indeed has to order and plan their seed in a timely manner. And if this isn't achieved, then a seed company will not produce that variety for them in organic form. And this will come back when we revisit the, uh, the guidelines. So this just gives you an example of the breadth of um, we're f growing seed in, in um, 14 countries uh, worldwide. And we don't, as I mentioned, sell the seeds. So what we do is we sell through distributors. This is just a sampling of them. And they trial or evaluate the cultivars we're developing on a bioregional level and choose the best cultivars to rep for their customer base. So if they target a small scale or medium scale grower in the northeast of the U.S., they'll have different cultivar selections from the Vitalis assortment than a distributor that's based in California servicing the Salinas area. So as I mentioned, we're certifying to uh, on a global level and each of these regions have different seed regulations and they have different ways in which they're interpreting the regulation. And I'm showing this because we have to, of course, comply to all of them, but also to sort of see what models or examples we can learn from the different regions that we're functioning in. So as um, uh, Kiki, excuse me, <laughs> as Zia mentioned, this is the language of our law. Um, this is the regulatory language in the USDA NOP, requiring organic growers to use organic seed when commercially available with, um, with exceptions. And as she also mentioned, the final guidance came out last year that provided some further interpretive language to the regulation. Um, but I don't think it's um, unjust to say that it's unfortunately not sufficiently explicit. And um, as also uh, uh, Zia mentioned and Chet will elaborate, we have a database now formed by the um, by growers and the non-governmental sector to support our regulatory interpretation. This is not an NOP developed nor NOP funded resource that we have that was developed by in, uh, interested organic stakeholders. So I, I'm going to just draw some comparisons specifically to the EU situation, predominantly because it's more evolved and it has more checks and balances for um, moving towards 100% organic seed usage. So explicitly in the EU, um, the database is mandatory and it's mandatory by regulation. Um, so the, um, each member state in the EU must have a database that reflects all of the varieties available um, in organic form. And companies must upload. Uh, it's not an optional um, situation as it is in the US. It's a mandatory um, database. And some of the aspects of things that are happening in the EU compared to the US is that uh, inspectors, when they allow a derogation or an exception to organic seed usage, this is also listed on the database. So seed companies and inspectors can not only see everything that's available in certified organic form, they can also see where a grower has requested an exception and where it's and, and if it's been approved. Um, another aspect of um, um, some there's some other aspects of things they're trying to to achieve, and I'll just touch on some of those. They also have expert groups, and the expert groups are comprised of growers, inspectors, and seed company representatives and scientists in the breeding field who can evaluate a crop group for a particular region and determine if there is a sufficient quantity of varieties available that would then close the derogation for that crop group. So for example, in the Netherlands, onions is a closed um, derogation crop. All organic growers of onions in Netherlands must use organic seed because it's been determined that sufficient cultivars um, are available in organic form. And there are a list of these available and their work and these expert groups meet regularly on a crop by crop and bioregion basis. Um, some other examples um, is that there are also 
uh, member state initiatives. And there's some really interesting ones like Bio Suisse, which is a certification body in Switzerland. They have a fund dedicated to um, compensate growers to fulfill the difference between the cost of conventional seed and organic seed. So while this tr transition is in process, the grower is not um, suffering from this discrepancy in the um, price between organic and conventional seed. Um, organic X seed database, if you, if you don't know this realm, that's a great, the most, um, most um, optimal example. That's a bioregional based database between Germany, Switzerland, Austria, and Belgium, where you can see all the varieties available there. Another example of how they're optimizing and really pushing um, this forward is they now list all, all varieties that are derived from um, CMS versus um, cytoplasmic mill sterility versus self incompatibility so that growers can make choices if they want to um, support that technique or not in the breeding process. And there's a session on that tomorrow. But in some, um, some persons and organizations uh, identify this as a GMO technique and the grower has the option whether they want to buy that or not. But at the same time, some certifiers have banned it entirely. But So just to give an overview, um, if you look at the language of the law of the EU, it's much more detailed in how it interprets um, organic seed usage, and it provides more explicit interpretation in the language of the law. So that's a very big difference for us. They have set closure dates, and which could align to what Zio was saying. They've pushed them out as well, and they actually went to the crop by crop, region by region model because they realized they couldn't achieve 100% closure by the date that they implied. Um, the, the, there's mandatory annual reports by each member state to show the progress of organic seed usage, and they've developed expert groups. They also use the term appropriateness. It's sort of, you could look at it synonymously a little bit to how the USDA NOP defines equivalency and type um, for com commercial availability. It's also very detailed, and they have groups that revisit um, this by crop group. So um, these are just, that's a summary again. It's just another model um, and how it is uh, more evolved. They did have their organic regulation in the EU uh, 10 years before us, and they have done rewritings three times. And each time the organic seed section of the regulation is more explicit and more developed. So these are just some, some ideas. Um, I wanted to just touch on four things, and I think some of these things have already been touched on in the previous presentations. But um, as a seed company, of course, what we do is a lot of trialing and to evaluate our material, as do universities, as do different farmer cooperatives and organizations, and OSA does a lot of facilitation of these processes. One of my recommendations would be that, that there is a more concerted effort to uh, collate and facilitate this process so that um, by bioregion we can get a more clear idea of what's working and not working for multiple reasons. So we can give better and more clear feedback to breeder companies and breeders that certifiers can be more clear on where growers are um, have gaps in their needs and that growers can be sharing information um, more collaboratively. And with that facilitated effort, we can have a clear idea of um, where we need, to, how we need to be stimulating the organic seed sector. Another aspect is just in general communication about the value of organic seed and what is organic seed and what does it mean in the production system. Uh, recently, we had a few experiences where we went to and um, visit some certifiers and there was two comments that were um, enlightening in that they, they see it as a, and one aspect, they go, it's an, it's an input, and therefore it can be calculated and um, envisioned like any input, like compost or um, whatever. But there is not an understanding of the life cycle of seed, that it, it requires time to produce and that it has a quality life cycle and that it can, it can uh, die or uh, wither in its, um, in its quality and that it is in a biological form. 
and that uh, that requires time and planning and that somehow in the inspection process it needs to be understood that it's not just did you make an attempt the day before you needed to plant did you make an attempt in time for it to actually be a reality the other thing is that uh, on the flip side of that i've had conversation with an inspector where they recently launched um, a new aspect of a database that listed uh, inputs available through OMRI. And I, I said, did you link it to the EOSCA database? And they said, uh, for organic seed. And they said, no, this is for inputs. So uh, it's also an understanding that organic seed is a valuable input and that it's not just all of the OMRI certified uh, products. It's also the quality and the value of the seed. Um, um, I think that uh, Chet will eval elaborate on the database, but you'll see from um, also what I said earlier and what he's going to talk about. This is a voluntary database. Seed companies have the option to upload. Um, the, the quality and the capacity and the effectiveness of the database is absolutely uh, hinged on seed companies listing their organic seed availability. If an organic seed company doesn't actually list their varieties, then we can't actually get a transparent perspective on what is available. And so I encourage you to, um, if you're a seed company to upload, but also if you're a grower and you're buying organic seed and you have a preferred supplier and you don't see them on the list, encourage them to do so. Um, also, my two other points would be just inconsistency in enforcement. I recognize that this is, as Zia pointed out, there's a lot of reasons for why inconsistent, um, why there are different methods for an inspector to interpret the organic seed clause, but the discrepancy is enormous. Um, there are many organic growers that don't make any attempts and they get their certification every year. And there are organic growers who've made it a priority to ensure they start their system with organic seed. And we have to continue to try to um, bring that more into balance so that there's a level playing field. Uh, lastly, I'd like to say that organic food companies and retailers have a role in this process and that we'd like to see that um, we have some organic food retailers who want their suppliers to use organic seed and they want to tell that story and be part of the story of organic integrity. And we have other organic suppliers who mandate conventional varieties for their systems. And how can we make that more, how can we support organic seed companies to see the value of organic seed in their final product? And how can we work with them and their suppliers to bridge that gap? Um, in closing, I just want to say that, um, that this is growing in spite of maybe the 15 negative things I said. Um, this is um, growing actually at a rate that, um, because I'm within the body of a conventional seed company, it's scaring the board of directors. Because um, in spite of all the nuance of what's not working, more organic seed usage is occurring. And more of the people who I never would have imagined to be on this side of history when I started at Enza would be there are the breeders who want to be there. They want to be breeding and selecting in organic systems. They fight for land at the certified part of our research station to breed because they see the differences of how cultivars are performing. And they actually see the difference in the organic movement and the population of the people and how engaged they are. So while um, there may be a quantity in some eyes, there may be a quality quantity gap it's growing and there's more varieties available in larger volume and more options for the whole sector.